Jika Foss, and I'm the Associate Librarian for the Social Sciences and Coordinator of the Diversity Alliance Residency Program. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, see, too far. Um, I also work as an organization development consultant, and um, it's what, one of the reasons I'm presenting on this topic. I like to work in the intersection of organization development and libraries after um, knowing libraries for so long. Um, so as we go through this presentation, um, I'm going to ask you questions and hopefully that you'll engage in the chat box. We don't really have that space to, to talk verbally or in person. so. Um, I'm going to make use of the chat box and I have that up as well as um, my notes from a PowerPoint. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so today's agenda, I'm going to talk about team-based work, um, overall psychological safety in terms of team-based work. We'll look uh, a little bit at leadership roles within this context and um, briefly touch on constructive conflict. Um, so today's goal is to give you an understanding of teams and it's the tangible knowledge of behaviors in team-based work. And um, again, we'll, I'll engage you in some questions as we go through. Um, so some context, um, I would sort of like to begin by giving some understanding of what we're gonna be talking about, as um, my experience uh, has been that there's um, a very varied knowledge of experience with regards to organization development and um, its connotations like organization culture and things of that nature. Um, so Jock's def definition of uh, organizational culture is, um, is defined as a traditional way of thinking. And if we pause on just that terminology, um, the first question that we sort of have to engage uh, in is whose traditional way of thinking? Um, so that statement in itself, it's quite ex exclusionary and it's something to reflect on. Um, Shine describes culture as a property of groups or an accumulation of learning that groups acquire over a length of time. Um, this definition emphasizes how people share the assumptions and um, with new employees, in particular how those assumptions are internalized as new employees come on, on board is something to consider. Um, as you think about your own experiences when you join your organization or if you're new to the field, um, how did you learn um, um, what you know about your organization? So a portion of accumulated learning can be truly passed on to new employees. Um, and that is both has, that it has both challenges and positives to it. So if you will uh, take to the chat box, how did you learn about your library's culture and was it all positive? I'm gonna give a, a little, a two minute window on that conversation if we can um, take a minute to think about that. So when you became on board, how did you learn um, about how your organization's meetings work, how people engage in conversation in those meetings, um, things of that nature. Does anyone have any uh, examples? Is my chat box broken? Ha, ah, talking to people, seeing how decisions are made, observation and word of mouth, absolutely. Learn by how organizational culture by observing meetings and doing what others did. Okay, so that has, um, so Marcus John says, uh, learn by doing what others are doing. And that has some both positive and negative connotations to it, um, uh, results as well. Orientation sessions by observation and making mistakes. And those are other ways of learning. So um, thank you everyone. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So with that in mind, um, so let's break that in, down a little bit more. Um, a basic assumption, um, how you know what you know what to do is called a basic assumption. It's a cultural phenomenon that takes, that is taken for granted and is created, uh, that is treated as non, excuse me, that is treated as non-negotiable. So, so much of what, um, so much so that if we're unaware of the basic assumption, you may be seen as difficult or um, uh, as dismissed for questioning things, for trying to ask questions. 
a basic assumption should be a common should be held in common by all the members but this doesn't always happen as we work in a time where not everyone will work in the same organization for a lengthy periods time um, and also during this time period where we're um, not working in the same place anymore um, we have so many different generations at work as well and because of that we also have um, we have a few um, skip that part um, so there there are these factors that go into working in um, in working with a basic assumption so a big basic assumption is created by the or, the original group and as new members come in, um, they adopt and um, adopt those uh, basic assumptions um, and modify them as organizations change and as members uh, leave and uh, new members add on. Um, so a, a group learns to cope with these um, adaptations and um, that internal integration, integration occurs. Um, so, so when someone new comes so in some cases, a basic assumption can be challenging. So when someone outside of a basic assumption group asks questions, the reaction and response um, may be personal. Um, and the internalized assumption, um, and this is where the challenge is, the internalized assumption can't be explained clearly. It is so internalized that it's just the way we do things. We've always done it that way. That kind of language surfaces. Um, and it, in some ways, it can't be challenged, and to even question, it becomes um, you. Bec that individual might become the outlier or a pro problem employee because of of asking questions is being seen as challenging. So, um, with that in mind, if you'll take to the chat box, what are some of your library's basics, uh, basic assumptions? We all have them. Mm -hmm. So coming into meetings prepared and having read the agenda, okay. But also how meetings function. Um, some meetings may formally start, you know, a few minutes after, but the basic assumption is meeting starts at 10, we should all be there at 10, but people come in five minutes after, 10 minutes after, and that's um, a basic assumption that, it, that is normalized and not questioned, and new employees um, get there early or on time and wonder why we're starting late. So that's another example of that. Any other examples? Go to that another minute. Rotating facilitator, note taking in each meeting. Yeah. Um, and is that a process explained to a new employee? Um, are they um, shepherded into that responsibility or are they um, dropped into it and told, hey, you're gonna be facilitating next month meeting, see ya. And are they given the context and understanding uh, of what their role is, how to facilitate, do they have facilitators training? Um, so also things to consider. We listen and possibly and possibly counter one another's statements respectfully. Okay, so there's engagement in that. That's great. It takes some time to get used to it. Absolutely. And so with new employees, are you um, giving those new employees, even if they are seasoned librarians, the context of and the the, in the cues of the work that you're doing in particular in groups? So something to keep in mind. Any other comments before we move on to the next page? Hierarchy, yes. Shane, do you wanna elaborate on that a little bit more? Uh, I, just from my, ex well, hello everybody. Um, just from my experience that um, one of the things you learn early on through observation and participating is uh, sometimes an unspoken hierarchy 
and how often people speak at meetings, how people respond to what they say, um, different sets of different expectations for different people that are that go unquestioned. So that's where that word means to me, I guess, in this context. All right, well, that's a great example. Um, are the rules um, for group meetings and group discussions, um, are they the same for everyone? And if they're not the same, if someone new comes in and sees these disparities, how do you reconcile that? How do you challenge that? How do you ask questions um, when the norm is um, potentially not to challenge, not to question, but to accept? Uh, Kathleen Bell has also how communication makes it through the hierarchy and who who can talk to certain people, absolutely. And that's organizational, um, that, uh, that will vary from organization to organization. So knowing that structure and knowing it's okay for me to go above my boss and to talk to her boss because um, that's the norm here. We have hallway conversations and in some other organizations um, that would get checked hard, absolutely. Thanks, thanks everybody. Okay, um, next slide. So, um, with that organizational context, let's take a little bit of, of a look at a teams. A group is, of, um, is a bunch of individuals with individual goals. A team has a shared common goal. Um, and someone gave me this great example so of, um, uh, for me that really visualized the difference between a team and a group. Um, a group is, um, so the gymnastics team, they can be both a group and a team. And, uh, the, so when a gymnastic team goes for individual medals, they have individual goals. But when they are, but that encompassing individual win makes a comprehensive team. And that team goal is for a team level gold medal, for example. Um, and I don't think I completely got that example right, but that for me, it gives me a, a pretty clear understanding of, are we really a group? We're individuals who do individual work uh, with individual goals, or are we a team with a shared common goal? So to break this down a little further with teams, a team has clear boundaries, boundaries, they're independent on common purpose and stability of membership. They have a clear challenging process, purpose, and, and, and is consequential in teams um, talent engagement with a, an end goal or, or a stated end goal. There's a structure that isn't overly complicated uh, which can create obstacles or under specific, which can put too much work on the team. Um, it needs a, the team needs a task that is both motivating and exercises autonomy about the work and the results. Um, in a supportive organizational context, um, resources and support that members need to carry out their work um, become important. And then finally, coaching um, for enhancing a team's performance, uh, a team's effectiveness. So if you have one team member who um, isn't um, contributing to the, the work, how do you coach that individual to, to step up or to find their niche within with that team-based work? Um, so here's a curiosity question for you. Um, in your experience with team-based work, um, do, are all of these variables that I've shown you, are they inherently built into the, your most recent teamwork, team-based work? And a yes and no can be an easy answer. We can't all be that integrated on text, can we? There's, okay, depending on the team. Thanks, Shane. Others? Okay. And that is um, a challenge, have not having a shared goal or an unproduct. Um, makes team-based work um, quite challenging. Um, and I think that in particular is um, 
one area because um, a team is supposed to be temporary. It has a goal, it has an end date. Um, and if it needs to be, uh, because the team can't go on forever, um, that motivation to do the work uh, diminishes the longer a team is together. So either the team needs to be revitalized with an updated goal or um, the team needs to disband to figure out um, what the next step could be. It takes some negotiating for the team to all clarify and be on the same page. And that is where really engagement, discussion, and safety come into play, which we'll go into next. Um, how do you have that space to have these discussions so that each team member is going to actively um, engage in the work that they're doing? Okay. Um, so team psychological safety, um, that's a quick definition of that. Um, so this is based off of Amy Edmondson. She's a Harvard professor. Um, and she defines psychological safety as um, shared belief uh, that the team is safe from interpersonal risk and that the team will not um, embarrass, reject, or punish someone within the team for speaking up. And this confidence stems from mutual respect and trust among team members. Um, so um, Ed Edgar Schein and uh, I forgot his first name, Dennis, um, proposes, proposed that a work team uh, environment characterized by psychological safety is necessary for individuals to feel secure and thus capable of changing their own behavior. Um, and then Shine goes on to talk about how um, he argues that psychological safety helps people overcome their defensiveness um, and it helps them learn. So, um, and that occurs when people are presented with data that disconfirms their expectations or hopes, which can um, which can, can be, which can drop productive learning behavior. Um, Edmund further states that a climate in which the focus can be on productive discussions enables, um, that enables er early prevention of problems um, and accomplishments of shared goals because people are less likely to focus on self-protection. So if we have that safety, we're not looking to protect ourselves, we're not looking to, um, to, to cause the least damage to ourselves by speaking up. Um, so that's something to, to think about. So in context to um, teams, psychological safety and trust, um, those both safety and trust um, describe uh, psychological states that um, involve risk, uh, vulnerability, and um, making choices that minimize negative consequences. Trust is about giving people the benefit of the doubt, right? Other people. Um, but psychological safety in the context of teams is whether others will give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, and when we talk, when we make mistakes in team-based work, so the reaction has a direct impact on, on our further involvement in that teamwork. So if we think about um, if we have made mistakes, uh, if, we, um, if we have the space to make mistakes and if that is mistake is um, it, how, that, the, how the team reacts to those mistakes, whether it's in um, group discussions or an embarrassing situation or um, a public mistake in, um, in a larger context, how, how we engage as a team to that individual is of consequence. Um, so, so in one way that if we have a negative reaction from the team, uh, we begin to monitor our own actions to protect ourselves and we speak up less. And that's, like, that's one consequence of, of not having team psychological safety. And I'm curious what others, uh, what other consequences you might have experienced when, com when it comes to team-based work. So what other actions do we take to protect ourselves? We don't volunteer to take on tasks, absolutely. 
because the results might not be to, yeah. First, deciding which team to be a part of if we have a choice, and sometimes we don't have a choice, we're assigned that work. We may not participate when certain people are in the room, absolutely. Um, and that is, I think that's a very good point, Monica. I'm sorry, it's not Monica, please correct me. Um, that not participating when certain individuals are in the room, whether it's leadership or something or someone else, that is um, certainly a real uh, factor in um, team-based work. And how do you engage that? Um, and is, is, is that your responsibility as a team member or is that leadership's responsibility to surface that and break, break through those difficulties? I'm getting away from the conversation. Um, speaking up less, uh, people up, allow mistakes to get bigger. So yeah, so if you see an error, but you're not gonna speak up because the last time you did, someone knocked you down for, for it. There is debate blame, absolutely. So instead of taking ownership as a group, we take blame to individuals. Following, forming allyship with individual team members before engaging the whole team. Yes, so um, basic assumption groups are created, absolutely. Monisha, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, delegate, delegation blame, okay. I actually both work as well. So delegating the work and blaming who's not doing it or who is um, who hasn't done that work. We accept defeat before we even try to express our opinions, but we don't speak up, yeah. And, and that's something to think about as well if the team dynamics are, well, they're gonna do whatever they want anyway. Um, how, do you, how do you get over that? And how do you work together as a team to not assume and, and not do the work because the assumption is that um, they'll go a different way. Become tripping over my own words and couching them in an I think and maybe. So giving qualifiers to your opinion instead of um, solidly uh, being comfortable in what you wanna say. So being um, squishy or um, less firm about your terminology. Wow, these are a lot of great examples. Thank you all for sharing. Okay. So, um, so a team has some responsibility in working together and building, um, uh, a, building a space for psychological safety to be able to do that work, but leadership does as well. Um, so uh, first and foremost, leadership's behavior are, is an example of how to behave. So um, emulating um, what you want to see in your employees is um, a pivotal piece. Um, but there are other areas of influence that leaders can um, be aware of uh, to, encourage, um, to encourage and influence um, safety in the workspace. So the uh, accessibility or approachability, um, that can reduce barriers that prohibit discussion. So if you're available and if you are um, open to having discussions, then others will see that and will be open to having discussions as well. Um, input and feedback, so inviting input and encourages psychological safety and having um, that engagement, that back and forth. Um, modeling openness, um, asking, so asking for feedback and suggestions encourages active participation. Um, so modeling openness and um, modeling the behaviors uh, sets a tone for others to follow. So if your organization is not known for um, um, having open conversation, doing so in public settings, in, in in, as a position uh, in the leadership position allows others to see that, see that there is safety and engage in um, their own growth in those areas. Um, so, and also being vulnerable clears barriers of, of status and differences so that people can see that um, me as a staff member, for example, can go and talk to my boss's boss and, um, uh, and not be um, worried that there will be consequences for having a, a simple hallway conversation or having a follow-up conversation to uh, a, a meeting the point. Um, so uh, team leaders, managers, and supervisors have the most direct influence on their members. And I think that's an important um, 
point to make um, as supervisors or managers. Um, um, you have the greatest influence, and so you're the most observed in your work setting. You have your employees have direct access to you. There's larger engagement with you as a, a manager and as a, as a, a supervisor or as a team lead. Um, and so that awareness um, should hopefully engage um, those individuals in, in the above behaviors so that, um, so that others um, will step up and create that safety for teams to do that work. Um, is there any additions to this um, list of uh, leadership behaviors? No? A minute is a very long time. Okay, so we'll go on. So, um, I think before we even go into the example of, of the model for uh, constructive conflict, and this is one of many that exists, um, I'm really curious, and I'm really hoping this is something that you all engage in. Do we as librarians and libraries and library staff, do we really engage in conflict? We engage in, engage in passive aggressiveness, but constructive conflict is what I'm curious about. What do you think? With patrons, ouch. Okay, other examples or other opinions? Because I have my opinion but after working in libraries for 20 years, but I really want to hear yours. Generally, we do avoid conflict. Anyone else? So I would agree with Sandy. Um, generally, we do avoid conflict and it's, um, it's almost in the manner that it like in a manner that it almost didn't happen. What Shane said, we don't always have the time or the energy to engage with conflict, so we avoid it. Okay, and that's actually um, good reasoning and understanding of why we avoid conflict. I appreciate that, Shane. But in some situations, um, I think when we have a differing of opinions, um, we could have, and maybe it shouldn't be the word conflict, but co constructive disagreement. Uh, Megan says, is it possible that most of us avoid because there are the few who just barge ahead, quote unquote, and tend to take over? Um, yeah, that is a variable, absolutely. Um, to, to, and, and I do want to engage Megan on, on that point as well. Um, so, with, and in, so I was saying instead of constructive conflict, we might say uh, constructive discussions. And in some ish areas, we avoid that as well. Let's say we have a differing opinion. And instead of engaging that opinion, um, there's, um, the, there's just an immediate dismissal of it. And even that has an impact on the room, on the team. Um, so not resolving that impacts the psychological safety of that team. So, it, it, so you know, earlier I said speaking up is um, something that will um, not happen if there is not psychological safety. And so situationally, resolving the conflict, finding a solution or giving space to um, other uh, uh, opinions and perspectives um, is, um, is something that we need to engage in. Um, uh, 
because if we're not, we're not going to rise above that personal emotion that the individual who is being ignored or steamrolled over um, is experiencing. And that experience is happening in the room. So everyone is seeing it. Everyone is not reacting to it. And how do you, how do you continue on and dismiss someone's experience or um, opinion and act like nothing has happened? Um, and if we do that consistently enough, that becomes an unsafe environment for everyone. Um, and so to, to Megan's point, is it possible for, it's possible that most of us avoid, and it leads to burnout. Thank you, Janice. Hi. Um, so it's possible that most of us avoid because um, there are few. And, and that's something for leadership to address and potentially uh, with regards uh, with using um, coaching. Um, if, I mean, we're all, we, we should all have a level of self-awareness about, our, about ourselves. And if that behavior of, of barging ahead or always voicing the opinion first so that there's no space for others to voice that, voice, uh, voice their opinion or have really a constructive discussion or, um, or something of that nature, if you don't have that space, um, the team will become ineffective. So that safety of that space um, becomes pivotal. Okay, so, um, so to, I was thinking about tools and resources that um, you, you all could use with regards to maintaining um, uh, that safety in the workspace and the team workspace. Um, I think one of my biggest suggestions is just deeper listening. Um, I think we, in general, um, listen to, is there a learned, oh, that's a, uh, Patrick asked a good question that I'll, I can take after I'm done with this last slide. Um, so I think deeper listening, not listening to confirm that what they're talking about is what you already know or um, what you can challenge, but listening for what people are saying and how, engaging what is being said versus um, um, the other. Um, one area that teams can develop is uh, community guidelines or um, do not have water. I do have water. Uh, community guidelines for how uh, teams will engage each other and then work to build on trust with each other before um, you do the team based work. Excuse me. Um, so before the work begins, um, work in building, um, having an activity or something of that nature with your leadership. Um, to build trust, to build that safety, put that in space and place, and then be, do that work. Um, and then remember to give space to all voices and having that awareness of, of oh, I talk a lot in these meetings, so I'm, I'm not gonna be the first one to speak um, um, on, on this topic. I'm gonna wait and, and, wait and let, uh, let others uh, speak up. Okay. Um, so questions, um, we'll start with Patrick's. And if there are other questions, feel free to type them into the box. So is there learned helplessness? To, to some degree, if the environment is not safe, um, it does become um, a level of helplessness so of, well, even if I say something, nothing will change. Or even if I say something, um, the results will um, not change. So that's a very good point, Patrick, thank you. Any other questions? Do you have any advice on when poor leadership is, is attributed to personality? As in um, the leader's personality or? Yes. Um, in uh, more, I always have clarifying questions. Um, advice in what, in what way of uh, poor leadership being a personality that they seem seems to happen in a very gendered way, as in women and men, or? Um, I have more questions about your question. When poor leadership is attributed to the personality. No, no, it's okay. Um, so with, in general, leadership, if, if they don't have the context and experience of leading and most librarians don't come with leadership experience. We learn it piecemeal on the job. 
Um, and okay. I've found that people who identify or are identifies as introverts are sometimes left out of the discussion because they don't like to talk, which is fundamentally not true because we need the space to, to reflect. Do you have any advice for those who identify? Okay. Um, they get passed over for being left. I still have to think about that, Janice. Um, can we follow up and we can talk about it later? Um, so M. Burke's question talks about introverts. And stop apologizing. Um, so, and that's a good point, uh, especially in this virtual environment, we need to make space for um, different types of learning. Um, and that immediate response is not something that we should expect from people, uh, especially those who need time to reflect and engage. So um, I would suggest that if there is um, something that needs discussion, that the, the documentation, for example, be sent out early so that people have time to reflect and can come in to engage in discussion and make that explicit. Um, here's the documentation that we need for this meeting next week um, and give, you know, an expense of time because we're all overworked um, and have people have that expectation so that both introverts and extroverts can engage in that discussion and also built into a meeting space um, just time for reflection and you know use uh, whatever excuse you need to say oh let me jot that down give me just 30 seconds and give people those that 30 seconds a minute to just process what's happening and it'll give people just a little bit extra time to to collect their thoughts gather their opinions jot them down enough that they can engage in the conversation further i hope those are um, productive suggestions and burke you're welcome how can a group members tactfully influence leadership to engage more constructively? Um, I think you need examples of their behavior that is not constructive and, and then safety to, uh, to know that you can go to your leadership and say, hey, I've seen you in meetings, I've observed your behavior, without saying observed your behavior, because you know, right away, um, and say, oh, well, I've seen you do this in meetings and, um, and I've seen the reaction when this occurs. And I'm wondering if there is another way for you to, um, to, to be able to engage uh, because it's shutting down conversation or it's, um, it's really freezing up people or, or it's, um, it's making people uncomfortable. Um, you know, have the data, give examples, give suggestions. Um, in a way, you're coaching up. So um, as long as you have that trust with your leadership to be able to coach up or to have those meaningful conversations, um, give that a try. But um, not one anecdotal, but multiple, um, which of course use carefully. Any other questions? We've got about a minute left. If you do have questions, you can email me. And thanks for all of coming. Hi guys. Oh, appreciate that.